Frank. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that we've been sparring for decades, so I'm going to start by asking you a couple of <laughs> difficult questions before I throw the floor open. Uh, to thank you, Anthony, for lining up. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned we all, want to get, we all want to get to Denmark. But assume that we are now Libya, trying to get Denmark. And you look at the countries that are getting to Denmark, whether it's South Korea or, or uh, Singapore and other places, one reason why they got there is because they had a very strong leader who just focused on getting the job done and said, I want to fix my country. So if someone like that arrived in Libya and suspended all the civil liberties, would you say, hey, that's exactly what Libya needs to do? Well, so it's absolutely correct that of those three institutions, the first thing that Libya needs is a state. Yeah. You know, they have to have a state. But then the question is, how do you get to a legitimate state? Because if you're just a strong man that is simply using force to knock heads and you know, produce order, uh, you will have a state that will last for a certain amount of time, but it will lack, you know, and the problem in Libya is that the two, you know, halves of northern Libya are divided tribally and, you know, in, in a lot of, regionally in a lot of other ways, and you're not going to have peace in that country unless there's some kind of a reconciliation. And so the leader, you know, that is a, you know, if you have a strongman leader, that leader is going to have to figure out how to bridge that gap. Uh, they're not going to be legitimate unless they do that. They don't have to be democratic necessarily, but they've got to be legitimate in the sense of uh, being accepted by, you know, the two halves of this extremely divided uh, society. So yes, I would say, so I know what you want to do. You want to get me to say, yes, I think we need a strong man like, you know. Like, I tried, uh, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, I'm, I'm, willing to con I'm willing to concede that in certain circumstances it is, you know, well, I mean, another, another case of that is what's just happened in Sri Lanka, which is actually kind of an amazing story. So you had this terrible civil war between the, the, the Buddhist and the Tamil community. Uh, the Buddhist community won that war. But then you had this strong man, Mr. Uh, Rajapaksa, who basically was not interested in actually building a legitimate uh, state on the basis of that victory and you know he's now been uh, voted out of office because I think there is a realization that you can't have legitimate authority you know unless you have this kind of reconciliation so that's why I think you know the strong man by himself is you know that's a starting point but it's not nearly enough to actually produce real order but at the same time just to quickly on to, it, it, it's very difficult to defend Rajapaksa but if you, if you had gone to Sri Lanka when the bombs were going off, there's no way that Sri Lanka could have succeeded with the bombs going off all the time. You needed yep. someone to switch off the bombs, and he switched off the bombs. And so in that sense, getting the, this, the primary order right is a critical yep. thing. Now, quick well, second question uh, on the United States. And you see, in many ways, the United States has always projected itself as a model for the rest of the world, has always said, if you want to succeed, follow us. But now, with, it, with, with what you call the vitocracy, and what it also means is that, in theory, as you say, rule of law means that the public interest is taken care of and not sectoral interest taken care of. But in America, you do have rule of law, but it, it ends up with sectoral interest being given priority over the larger public interest. So doesn't that mean that in some ways, you also got to qualify whether or not America really has the rule of law it needs? Well, so I think what is necessary is balance. Uh, that is to say, you need state power and you need to constrain state power. And I think that both law and American democracy have provided too many constraints. So even in the, in the realm of law, uh, there's a large section on my book about the fact that, uh, you know, in American law, we don't rely on the state to enforce laws. We rely on private individuals who can sue the state you know, to stop it from doing something or to make it do something. And the result is very, very inefficient. Uh, uh, that's why we have so many lawyers in this explosion of lawsuits uh, and so forth. And so that's another example of, you know, excessive division of power. And so I think some of that needs to be walked back so that you can make uh, decisions a little bit more uh, efficiently. But to do that, you've got to persuade the U.S. Supreme Court to change the ruling, right? Yeah, and that's, 
So this is, I think, another aspect of political decay is that all institutions have to adapt. And we've kind of put these straitjackets on ourselves that, that make it hard to adjust uh, our institutions to present circumstances. Yeah. Okay, by the way, I want to remind you all that uh, Frank is gonna sign his book outside. Huh? So please buy as many copies as you can. <laughs> So Anthony, you get the first question, and those who, those whose questions, please come to the microphone, line up, please. Please go to the microphone. Thank yes, you very ahead. much, Dean. Fifty years ago, when Gilas Milovan wrote a book like Political Decay in Yugoslavia, Tito jailed him. Times have changed. You can speak here quite openly. But about in the 90s, huh? In the same place in Yugoslavia, Madeleine Albright has a very interesting proposition. And she said, if the US is so powerful, why do you don't you use your military power? And she said that to Colin Powell. And to me, that is like the Albright proposition. So as you see it in Libya, the Obama regime bombed them. In ISIS, they bombed them. But in a previous time, when uh, the look for proposition says, give war a chance, Bush went to war. But the point is this. When you talk about China, US, Japan, Russia, political decay, then you come to the issue of the chemistry of it. And the chemistry of it is, if there is political decay, then what is the risk of spontaneous combustion? Because you have the Russian who is behaving like Catherine the Great, collector of the earth. She, she just collected Crimea. Uh, you have Xi Jinping just saying to the PLA, for maybe domestic consumption, prepare for war. You have a new defense minister in Japan who says he doesn't mind preemption, which is a radical change from times past. So Anthony, you have to ask your questions. The question is, what is the risk of spontaneous combustion in a decay? Thank well, you. I uh, think that the world is pretty dangerous right now, actually. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't predict war in East Asia, but the whole relationship of China to both other countries in Southeast Asia and to Japan is very troubling uh, because, you know, it's this classic case of a rising power that is changing the distribution of power in the international system, and it's very hard for everybody to adjust to that. And so I have been quite worried, you know, I'm sure that neither Japan nor China uh, or Vietnam wants war, but neither did anybody in 1914 either. And yet you got, uh, you know, you got into a war. Uh, I think the situation, well, there is a war going on in Ukraine right now. I mean, there's an active shooting war going on in Ukraine. Uh, and that is also potentially very destabilizing because the whole post-1991 territorial settlement in Europe was based on this idea that if you're a Russian living outside of Russia, you would just stay there. And now uh, Putin has basically told them, no, in fact, you're going to get help from Russia. So I think it's a very troubling situation. And I'm, you know, I think that um, you, we, we, we risk a lot of conflict. OK, Frank, I, as usual, I see lots of questions. I'm going to take three at a time. If you don't okay. mind, you can take notes, OK? So I'm going to take the f one, two, three, f uh, the first three mics. Then I'll come to the, the back mics later, please. Hello, Professor. Uh, my name is Manmeet Singh Aluwalia. I am from India. We've just come for one week of executive learning program in the Lee Kuan University. And uh, yesterday in our seminar, we were told that Professor Francis Fukuyama is about to come. So I just made my way through. And uh, I am thankful to you to deliver this lecture. I have lots, many questions, but I'll start with one. Because Please. this is what I have observed in Singapore in the past three days when we talk about democracy. My question to you, Professor, is that will democracy and freedom of press go together or democracy can sustain itself with, without giving the citizens the right for the freedom of expression? Because I was amazed 
by the analogy you brought forward. I think a couple of people chuckled during the seminar when you said, I don't know, time will tell if he's a good emperor or a bad emperor. And somehow, what appeared to me in the Singaporean cases, I will apologize if I offend some sentiments, but I have, I have been told about this that uh, the Singaporean government is semi-autocratic. And that has been labeled in the press, in the media, everywhere. They say they don't allow the freedom of press to survive. And when I ask people in the corridor, especially Singaporean youth, about the future of Singapore, and they always talk hush-hush, they're like, okay, we don't want people to hear it. They tell something. No, that is just not right. Because we have been brought to Singapore from India to study how a first world country looks like. And when we are in India, we are think about there's a freedom of expression, there's freedom of press, there's debate, there's discussions, everything that you call about the United States of America that you talk okay. about. Yeah. Can you, can you, if okay. you don't mind, just ask. I, 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 think you, I get you a little excited question. when I come about it because you said it's one question. I don't want to get killed off like the previous one. So, yeah. thank you. that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. We have to go to the question. Next one, yeah, please. I'm Tan Keng Soon from the Tan Ing Kiam Foundation. Earlier, uh, Mr. Fukuyama, you, are, you said that the U.S. tried to transplant its institutions to the Middle East countries like Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, try to bring democracy to them, and it's not very good at it. My question is, what role, if any, did the culture and religion of the people in the Middle East have to do with its failure? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for keeping your question short. Can I encourage all of you, please, to keep your question short? Because otherwise, and this is about being democratic, giving everybody a chance, okay? Uh, if all of you ask long questions, nobody can ask questions. <laughs> please, next one. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Fukuyama for an utmost beautiful lecture. Uh, my name is George Komnenus. I will keep it short. So, uh, You gave a beautiful overview of three variables, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Power. Uh, from the state, the state wanting more power, on the other hand the rule of law, and on the other hand you uh, spoke about accountability, if I'm not mistaken. But it's a beautiful overview and uh, afterwards you gave uh, yeah, and, uh, two polls in that, uh, in that respect, opposite polls, the United States and China, and you didn't give actually an, uh, your own uh, uh, your own opinion on what would be the, the, the most perfect uh, system. But uh, my question is, uh, could you give uh, maybe an indication of how you would place uh, Singapore and the Singaporean government in respect to these three variables and in respect to this, this yeah. uh, poll, two polls that you uh, have made, and perhaps also uh, in, that, in doing that touch upon the trias politica. That was all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. three questions. So uh, maybe I can actually yes. answer the first and the third at the same time. So yes, I do not believe that you can have true accountability without freedom of the press because if people don't know what the government is doing, uh, they can't hold it accountable and the government will, won't feel accountable. So uh, that's very important. Uh, so Singapore, so in, in, when I'm lecturing, Singapore always occupies one of the squares in the matrix because uh, Singapore obviously has a very successful modern state. It also, compared to China, has a pretty strong rule of law, uh, which is a very important uh, uh, asset. Uh, the democracy part is the problematic part because uh, it's a one-party system in which you don't have full freedom of media and don't have fully free uh, competition. And, you know, my sense is that the workability of that system was very, very much dependent on the, you know, the personal character of the founding generation of Singaporean leaders. But the problem with that kind of a system is how do you keep renewing that leadership? So, or the way I put it to my students is, it's, so it's fine you have a good emperor, Lee Kuan Yew, but where do you, you know, where do you assure this continuing supply of Lee Kuan Yews? you know, down the, down the years. And that's very hard, and I don't think any non-democratic system has ever solved that problem. You know, where's the next Lee Kuan Yew going to come from? The other question about culture. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. The, so, yes, culture is definitely a problem, uh, although you can use institutions to overcome cultural 
you know, things like ethnic division, and a number of societies have done that, uh, you know, quite successfully. So uh, I think that clearly uh, there is a, I, I guess I resist certain conclusions, for example. So it is very common for a lot of people to say, well, the problem is Islam. You know, there's something inherently violent that creates, you know, suicide bombers and radical Islamism and so forth. And I think that that is very ignorant of the actual history of, of Islam because, you know, all cultural systems can be interpreted in many, many different ways. We didn't have suicide bombers 50 years ago, so something else is triggering, you know, that kind of uh, phenomenon other than culture. And I, uh, as general advice to my students, I, I tell them, don't turn to a cultural explanation until you've exhausted all the other ones, like short-term incentives and institutions and, you know, that sort of thing, because I think it's the refuge of intellectually lazy people to say, well, it's just a cultural problem. Okay, we're now we're going to go to the gentleman at the back. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Prof. Mabugani and uh, Prof. Fukuyama. I just, uh, you kind of preempted my question, and perhaps I'd like to add a little bit to the Indian gentleman earlier, because uh, I think, uh, co uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, our wise emperor, once said that he doesn't believe in the exuberance of a, uh, perhaps like a liberal democracy because it hinders development. Hence, he wants a more controlled path towards uh, development and democracy. Uh, that's perhaps why we have a rather more subdued, but if you look into the inner layers, a strong debate as any liberal democracy you know, in Singapore. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, uh, if you just said that culture is, should be the last reason, but you wrote a previous book which I enjoyed very much on trust, and I'd just like to ask, like, uh, for, Singapore, uh, for United States, right, it seems that a lot of Americans have, uh, like, for example, Krugman has said that they've lost faith in the American dream and in the American institutions. And for China as well, they don't seem to have a, a high level of trust. So could you comment on that, like whether how to rebuild the trust back in both nations so that they can have uh, more faith in their governments? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's an easy question, yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, good evening, Professor Fukuyama. My name is Darian Mohan. I graduated from a Singaporean high school last year. Uh, my question is, what do you think the implications on America's political decay would be should the House, the Senate, and the White House all be controlled by a single party? Thank you. <laughs> We're going to get a single party state in the United States. <laughs> Over there. Okay. Thank you, Dean and uh, Professor. I'm, my name is Sun Xi, an uh, MPV graduate from the Lee Kuan School. Very short question. Uh, when will be the end of history? <coughs> Have you changed your answer compared to two decades ago? Yeah. Okay. okay. So you got three questions here. So um, rebuilding trust. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> how to rebuild trust? That's a hard <laughs> question to answer, uh, and it depends, I guess, on what kind of trust because. Distrust of government is is different from social distrust of fellow citizens or your neighbors, or, and they've got different kinds of solutions. So I think on a micro level, uh, you build trust by bonding people around common values or experiences or history. And I think any you know, corporate leader understands that if you want to you know, increase trust within the organization, there are ways of doing that. What's much harder is to do that on a society-wide uh, basis and what's very hard to do is is on a for a government to rebuild trust once it's been broken. But I think, you know, ultimately uh, you have to. People distrust governments because they don't work. They're ineffective. They're they don't deliver on what they promise. So if you're going to rebuild trust, the government actually has to figure out how to do something effectively, and that's the way that you can you know get out of this uh, this low trust uh, equilibrium. Uh, the implications of decay in the United States, well, yeah, if you had one party controlling uh, all three branches of government, yes, you wouldn't have deadlock and 
government shutdowns and we would be able to make a certain set of decisions more equally and I think both parties are hoping that that'll happen to them but I want to point out something in the American system so the Democrats controlled all three branches for a very long period from uh, basically 1932 up until the 1980s and yet we didn't get civil rights legislation through until uh, the 1960s because a minority of southern states were able to block civil rights legislation. And so this is the characteristic of our check and balance system. Even if you have a majority party that controls three branches, it's still possible to veto things. And, and that's why you know, a lot of Democrats are hoping that demographic changes will produce you know, democratic control of, uh, you know, of the whole government over time. But that's not going to solve you know, some of the problems. Uh, and then... Um, the end of history. Um, yeah, so my views have changed in the following ways. So first, uh, I think that I'm much more aware of the difficulty of creating institutions uh, than I was. Uh, and, and part of that just has to do with the work I've done in governance issues in poor countries, you know, in, in the developing world, where it's really very difficult to, especially as I said, create modern states. Uh, and I realized that this was kind of a mystery about how they came about in the first place, and that's why I wrote these last two books, is to try to explain to myself how that actually happened. And then, you know, obviously when I wrote The End of History, I, the theme of decay wasn't there. Uh, I wasn't talking about how political systems would potentially go backwards, and so I think that's also, uh, you know, a new element in, in the way I think about things. Okay, you know, we're supposed to finish at 6.45. Can we carry on to 7 o'clock? It's up to you. Is that okay with you? You all agree? So I'm sorry, it means you'll have your dinner 15 minutes later, but uh, we'll carry on trying to get as many questions as we can. Again, if you don't mind, everyone, keep it short, sharp. Uh, hi, Professor uh, Francis Fukuyama. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name is Desi, and I'm a student at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, my question would come in two parts, and it's really a one question. Uh, perhaps you talked about the strong leadership being a good um, start to uh, political institutions and democracy in general, but what is your take on the idea that elites could be a group of benevolent elites or trustees to a democracy in, in a way that you know, they're enough, there's enough um, reason to trust uh, a, group, a small group of people at the top of a uh, uh, democracy or society to sufficiently represent uh, citizen demands. So, and the second part of the question is that how do you ensure this uh, sort of oligarchy or uh, elite group um, to have limits before they veer into populism? Because that's um, sort of like a bit of the, in terms of probably some Asian democracies, there are also a tendency to become more populist um, as the democracy starts to evolve. Thank you very much. Over here, please, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Professor Fukuyama, for your talk this evening. I'm Chatrini Viratunga, and I'm a student at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and I'm from Sri Lanka. Um, as you mentioned, Sri Lanka has just recently elected a new government, which is trying to rebuild uh, the democratic institutions. And my question is, uh, what is your advice to this new government in creating and establishing a political order? Okay. okay, one more. Okay, I'm Alexander Karolyov from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and my question is about consistency of social science work, because in early 90s you published your famous piece, The End of History, in which you were saying that what we were witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War, it's the universalization of liberal values and the growth of marketization, but in 2008 you published a piece in Newsweek titled The End of America, in which you were saying that together with Wall Street's firms, the vision, certain vision of capitalism collapsed and uh, American brand severely damaged. So, uh, was severely damaged. So obviously there are two ends in your story. One is the end of history, the other one is the end of America. So, uh, could you please explain the logic of <coughs> shifting from one end to, yeah. to the other? Thank you. Okay. Um. So on the question of <clears throat> elites, uh, there's no question that all societies have elites and that certain 
elite-run societies can actually run very well. But the question in all of those cases is, uh, how do you guarantee the, you know, the continuity and the reproduction of elites over the generations? Now, <coughs> dynastic China solved that problem in a certain way because many of the cultural institutions were designed to reproduce those elites. That's what Confucianism was really about. So the education system, the examination system, and so forth was meant to ensure that you'd have a class of bureaucrats that would rule the country and that they would have a certain level of education and that it didn't depend on the whim of a particular emperor, political leader, you know, for that to happen. And I think one of the issues that faces modern China right now is that in a sense, they, they're the heirs of that tradition. You know, meritocracy is important, but they've also got other principles like Marxism and, and other ideas mixed in, and it's not clear how this elite manages to reproduce itself, you know, consistently uh, uh, over time. Um, I think you were alluding to populism in Asia. Uh, you know, I don't know whether you're referring to Thailand, but that's probably the country that, you know, comes to mind where, uh, you know, you've had the breakdown of Thai democracy because essentially you had an elite running that country. Uh, then you had Toxin's election. He's a populist. He's, you know, personally corrupt, but he's also democratically representative of this rural, large rural population uh, in Thailand, and basically the Thai elite doesn't like it, you know, and they, and, and actually between the, the red shirts and the yellow shirts, you know, I sort of feel like saying a plague on both your houses because, uh, you know, on the one hand, Toxin represented, you know, uh, something, he, he was not a good governance guy, right? But on the other hand, that elite just doesn't want to give up power, uh, even when it's pretty clear that majority of the Thai population is actually benefiting from his agricultural the agricultural subsidies and so forth. And so I think <clears throat> that both of them really need to rethink, uh, you know, rethink their positions. On Sri Lanka, I think the, the, the task in, in front of the current government is really clear. There has to be a, a reconciliation after this terrible war you know, between the major ethnic groups in Sri Lanka. And so far, so good. You know, so far the new uh, uh, president seems to be aware that that is the agenda. And it was interesting, his support, you know, comes from the, you know, the non-Sinhalese uh, groups, and he has tried to be more inclusive, and that's really important. But beyond that, he's also got to deliver, you know, on basic services and getting the economies, you know, moving and uh, this sort of thing if you are going to act you know, because that's really what helps to ease these kinds of ethnic tensions. Now, the last question on whether I contradicted myself, no, the answer is absolutely not, because I never associated the end of history with the specifically American form of either democracy or capitalism. In fact, I, <laughs> Alexandre Kojev, who is the uh, philosopher that I was quoting uh, in the end of history, who, who said that history ended in 1806 at the Battle of Jena, uh, actually would have said, and I would have agreed with him, that the European Union comes much closer to representing the end of history than the United States does. Uh, you know, the United States has got a very peculiar form, both of market capitalism and of democracy. So as I said, uh, we have many more checks and balances than a typical European parliamentary democracy. And in the 1980s and 90s, we got carried away with market liberalism. You know, we deregulated too much. And that's the model that was, dis well, the, the political model of using force, you know, in, in the way the Bush administration did, and the economic model uh, of a completely deregulated financial sector, those blew up. Those were policy mistakes, they blew up, but that's not the same thing as either market capitalism or liberal democracy blowing up. That was just a very specific American interpretation. Okay, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's the last six we will take no more after this. So I'll take them in phases of three again. So one over the back there, two and three. Please. 
Good evening, my name is Samuel. I am an undergraduate student at the National University of Singapore. I have a question to you with regards to something you wrote in 2004 in Foreign Policy. And in 2004, you named transhumanism as the most dangerous idea in the world. Ten years later, do you still stand by the claim? Thank you. Okay, next one here. Again, sharp, uh, sharp I'm question. Tan King Soon from Tan Ing Kiam Foundation again. Thank you very much for answering my earlier question. I thoroughly enjoyed your answer. Now, my, this question is regarding India and China. Uh, as we all know, in, China has uh, grown and progressed faster than India. So, since you say culture is the last refuge of the lazy, uh, so it must be institutional reasons for that. So my question is this, why is dictatorial China doing better than democratic India? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hello, good evening, uh, Professor. My name is Tao Minghui and I'm from Raffles Institution. So my question is really simple. You said that China and the US are very at, at, they're at the opposite ends in terms of political order. So I was just interested to ask, uh, are there going to be any similarities between them in terms of political decay or are they still going to be extremely different? Thank you. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> on the transhumanism thing. What is transhumanism? Well, it's just genetic engineering and, you know, trying to make better human beings and, and, and so forth, which was the oh, subject okay. of the book that I wrote in 2001 called Our Posthuman Future. So, one of the problems is that when you write articles, you don't actually write the title. Some editor writes the title. <laughs> and that particular article, uh, and including, I think, the one about America blowing up or something, I didn't write those titles. That was just some editor that wanted to give it a sexy, you know, uh, I mean, they well, wanted I mean, to attract. You sell a lot of books, you can't complain. Well, uh, no, the end of history was my title, but, but these other ones weren't. Uh, so whether it's the most dangerous problem, I don't know, but I think it is a problem because I think that technology is giving us new opportunities to control the behavior of other human beings. And we've tried that a lot in the 20th century and, and it always has these very uh, bad unintended consequences. And I, I do worry about uh, the fact that this kind of biotechnology uh, will do the same. On the India-China question, that's a topic of a separate lecture, but I would say that India has been held back in recent years because its political system has not been able to deliver strong government, in effect. So just infrastructure. Like the Chinese really can do infrastructure, and India can't. It can't build airports, roads, dams, you know, all that sort of thing. And that is a big uh, problem for them. Uh, uh, and so, as I said, I think that's one of the reasons that Mr. Modi was elected, because a lot of Indians, especially in the business community, are hoping that he can break through all this blather of you know, Indian politics over the last few years and actually get, uh, get some stuff uh, done. Now, whether China and the United States will converge, yeah, all countries are engaged in a process of, of competitive decay. And sometimes the country that ends up on top is the one that decays the less, least fast. And one issue, uh, you know, uh, affecting China, although China does not have interest groups the way the United States does, it does have interest groups, you know, state-owned enterprises, there's, you know, different parts of the government and the party all constitute very powerful entrenched interests, and the last uh, government in China wasn't very effective in overcoming, you know, their resistance to, I think, a number of economic reforms that were actually quite important, and so that might be a problem. My hope is that actually there will be a certain convergence because I would like to see the United States be less deadlocked and more decisive and I want to see the Chinese government more limited and constrained in terms of its decision making. Primarily I think not so much in the short run by democracy but more by the rule of law. That they need laws to limit the discretion of you know, powerful people in, uh, in that society. Okay, last three questions, quickly. Yeah? Hi, good evening, Professor. My name is Ng Chi Xiang, and I'm a graduate from uh, Raffles Institution. 
Uh, lately, in the political discourse of many places, especially in the United States, there seems to be this overall trend in the world of some form of inequality in many economies. So the question I would like to ask you is, how is this form of inequality going to go and result in, what kind of impact this inequality will have in the development of yeah. states in future, especially with many groups now saying that the current way that statecraft occurs doesn't work? Okay, last two questions. Uh, good evening, Prof. Uh, my name is Echo. I'm a PhD candidate from the Political Science Department of NUS. Uh, I have a question regarding the definition and scope of public interest in your framework. Um, taking the case of Russia as an example, if the people elect or advocate um, an authoritarian leader, knowing his uh, leadership style and personality, then wouldn't that phenomenon itself reflect the public interest? Or if you take public interest as a universal set of values, then you know that really implies that these people do not know what they want. So may I know your opinion on this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, good evening, Professor. Uh, my name is Liang Ce. I'm a graduate student from NUS Department of, Department of Political Science. Uh, my question for you is, uh, Shun Peter in his book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, he argues that democracy should be seen as a method, not an end. So I want to know what is your take on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the question on inequality, I think, is probably one of the, the chief uh, really difficult problems that, that, and it's not just democracies. I mean, inequality has been increasing, you know, very, very rapidly in China as well. And I think that a lot of it has a very common source, which is technology. That middle class jobs have been eroded by the fact that intelligent machines can increasingly do work that low-skilled and increasingly sort of mid-skilled people used to be able to do, and all the rewards are going to people with, you know, good cognitive abilities and good educations and that sort of thing. And I frankly do not see a clear solution to this. Uh, I mean, I do think that to some extent you're going to have to do redistribution, but the old kind of socialist or social democratic um, uh, kind of welfare state solutions, you know, we've seen the limits of that also. And, and, uh, uh, and so I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's very important from the standpoint of democracy because if you have a few very rich people and a lot of people that aren't doing well, that's not a good condition for, you know, I think good politics in general because it sets up, you know, a really polarized society you know, with, with elites and with a popular, you know, populist, very unhappy mass uh, of uh, people. So the question about whether there is a public interest or whether the, you know, public interest is simply whatever people at any given moment choose, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question in, uh, you know, in democratic theory. Uh, I actually happen to believe that public interest is not simply the aggregation of preferences of the people at one particular time, because first of all, that, those views change. You know, so Russian people may actually decide they hate Mr. Putin in five years, you know, and, uh, and, and I think that the broader public interest of Russia is probably contained not in, you know, the first choice or necessarily the second choice, but is you know, something a little different representing, you know, their broad interests over a longer period of time. Uh, what that is exactly is a little bit hard to say, but, but I don't think that you can simply say that public interest is simply what people vote for. Because people, yeah, I mean, in democracies, a lot of times people make really stupid choices and, and do things that they come to. Uh, then, then you change the people. Yeah, you change the people, yeah. Well, that's why democracy, yeah, it needs education and it needs deliberation, you know. I mean, if you don't have deliberation in democracy and kind of exchange of information and shape preferences over time, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to work. Uh, and I'm sorry, the last question reminds... Is democracy a means, not an end? Oh, no. So in my uh, humble opinion, uh, democracy is an end in itself because I believe that uh, part of the human personality uh, wants agency. 
uh, it wants choice, and it wants choice in the political realm, that you can't be a full adult if you don't have a share of rule. I mean, this is a classic understanding uh, of liberty, that you're not a fully free person, you're not a full adult, unless you can share in political power in your community. And therefore, I think that even in a well-run autocracy where everybody's rich and secure and taken care of in material terms, if you do not have a share of political power, you have a stunted and, and incomplete life. And that's why I think there is an intrinsic value to, you know, to democracy, that it recognizes citizens as full adults uh, and not as, and, and to some extent, you know, every authoritarian regime, uh, you know, to some extent treats its citizens as if they're children. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, people grow up and they want to be adults, so. I'm sure you all agree that we've, we've been blessed uh, that Frank has shared his wide and deep learning with all of us. The bad news is that we only had 19 minutes with him. The good news is that you can pick up and read what he wrote seven days a week. So I strongly <laughs> encourage you all to buy his books uh, out there and you'll discover a lot more wisdom uh, in those pages there also. So now please join me in thanking Frank for his wonderful <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.